Help us, O oh God, to be positive addition to the kingdom of your dear son. May we not be a reproach. We give you glory and praise, our Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, I welcome each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining early. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kala Wali, Longe. You know, um, let's, uh, if, if it's possible, let's just remind whoever needs to be reminded of this meeting, this last second. You know, just give me a second to get it. It was, was chilly earlier. It's getting warm now. You know, you know, so uh, let's just send out a reminder. I'll quickly just do that. And um, uh, it has started. Okay, and if you need to, if you need to call anyone or just buzz them, just send them a text or something like that. I think this is the best time to do it, Ali. <coughs> Yeah, this Sorry. is the time to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I put up an advert for today's meeting saying that, like never before in the history of marriage, we developed a coaching curriculum for men on how to be spirit filled husbands. And please understand that the caveat and the qualifying there of the husband being spirit filled is because um, we can't advocate the same thing for all men in general. We cannot afford to postulate to unbelievers who don't have the life of God. The same thing with the same standard of what we expect of those that have the life of God. You know, so, uh, my position is going to be about coaching the men that have the life of God. This is very, very important. So that when the Bible says a thing, we can walk away knowing that this is constitution for our lives. This is constitution. It's not optional. It is not a suggestion. The fact that what is being said is coming through the lips of one brother Ken and Segeme does not mean that he is the one speaking, you see. But the, as long as it is God's word, it's time for us to begin to make ourselves obligated to do the word, not do your culture, not do your tradition, not do what comes easy for you. That's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. You know, the, 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 the message of grace is wonderful, but it should not be misunderstood to cancel out the place of a reward, the reward system in the kingdom of God. Not everything is free in the kingdom of God. Salvation is free, but how you grow upon that salvation is reward. It's based on reward system. It's not the same thing. Two people can give their lives to Christ in the same church under the same doctrine. And six months later, one person is walking with God at such a high level and the other is still struggling with the most primordial sentiments as though they've never heard the gospel. So that the only mark of their Christianity is that they join church, they are there in every service. So please, it's imperative for us to understand that some things are by reward, not grace, not not um, not bestower, not transferred, not impact, not imparted. It's reward. It's reward. Nobody, for example, can build your prayer life for you by imparting it onto you. No, if you don't pray, you don't pray. If you're a prayerless Christian, you're a prayerless Christian. There's no other way to say it. Grace will do his work, but your prayerlessness will also have its own impact. It will, it will cost you a reward you didn't get. It will. There is no gain saying about it. Let's not uh, camouflage this thing. What grace will do, grace will do. What is based on the reward system? We only come to you on the basis of the terms of that reward. For example, please write this down if you are writing. The kingdom of heaven is about a place. 
But the kingdom of God is about a system. The kingdom of heaven is a place you die and you go to. But the kingdom of God is God's way of doing things. So when we say we want to oblige ourselves to the kingdom of God, we are not saying a place far away in heaven. We are talking about God's way of doing things. God's way of doing the same thing that every other person is doing. God's way of marrying. God's way of being a husband. God's way of being a father. And during this meeting, I want to beg the women to be, to be very, very um, articulated. You know, gather your thoughts, write them down before it is time to make contribution. As to when we say we want to be good husbands to you, what do you want us to be in order to score hundred percent on being a good husband to you. It is your articulation that is going to help us give meaning to the objective of being spirit-filled husbands to you. This is very, very important. And like I, I said to the Canadian class, if you keep quiet in these meetings, please don't ever wake up and complain again. Don't. God gave you the chance to speak up in his presence. In Malachi chapter 3 and in verse number 16, Malachi 3 verse 16, he said, when they that fear the Lord, they speak one to the other. God was there with a notebook and he began to write down what they were saying and he blessed them. He, he put something in place on the basis of what they were saying. So if you don't speak up in these meetings, um, you should hold your peace forever. Don't ever complain again. Don't say men are bad. Don't, don't say anything against men. Don't say anything about men. Just be quiet. Don't be quiet. If you can't say it on the, on the platform, send it to me as a private message on plus one, 416-409-0566. A lot of you already have my numbers. You know, so send it as a private text. We'll deal with it. We'll take note of it. We'll give judicial notice to it and we'll treat it accordingly. But if you don't speak up in the house of God, please just hold your peace forever. Don't, don't go around tearing down the body of Christ. You had a chance to speak. You know, so having said that, um, I'm going to break this, this whole subject into three, uh, uh, into three parts. The way God has laid it on my heart today, I'm going to deal with the why. Why must we arise and concert our efforts and develop a compendium of, you know, material that will become the curriculum for coaching men on being spirit-filled husbands? Why? The why is what I want to deal with today. By next week, by the grace of God in the part two, I will then deal with the needs of women in marriage. Now, while I'm extrapolating from the standpoint of research uh, results, you should open up and tell us your own need in marriage. You should let us know. And for those of you that are doing well in your marriage, you should share your formula. This is how I got over ABC. Where others crumble, this is how I have made it, so that we can have an understanding of what scripture is saying through what you have shared with us. The number again, uh, Kola Wale, help me type it out. Uh, the number is plus one, 416, plus one for Canada, 416, 409, 0566. Plus one, 416. 409-0566. Then in the part three, we'll now come into a crescendo on how to treat her right. But even as we begin to deal with the why, we'll begin to see why we must deal differently with her. This is very, very important. This is so, so important. So that all of us can be on the same, on the same page. And then please, if you are present in this meeting today, you owe it to God, to yourself, to make sure that you are here for the next two meetings 
so that all of us can put our voices together. I'm not speaking to us from the standpoint of Mr. Know It All. No, 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 no. God gave me the grace and the opportunity to go and research on your behalf. So I'm going to share with you what I have found through his spirit of grace. But you must bring your voice, you know, uh, 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 and join what we are doing here. You know, uh, it's going to be recorded and it's going to be sent to uh, somebody else in, uh, in Cincinnati and he's going to transcribe it so that we can develop a document out of this. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to say just about, about seven things, two introductory and then five major points on why we must, in this time in history, develop a coaching curriculum for men on how to be spirit-filled husbands vis-a-vis -vis how to treat her right, how to treat the wife right. For my scripture reading, uh, I want to read from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, and then Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, and then Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. In Hebrews chapter 3 and in verse 4, the Bible says, every house is builded by some man, and the builder of all things is God. In other words, what works in a marriage is because somebody made it work. So a man must take responsibility for the building up of the structure in his marriage. God builds all things, working in partnership with us. God builds all things as we rely upon his grace to do the work. But somebody is got to be on earth, taking responsibility for the details of how these things are worked out. This is very, very important. Now, the reason a meeting like this should grow and have tens of thousands of people in attendance, is not to gratify the ego of the, of the convener. No, it is because these matters are critical to us. It's because it's critical to us. So that if you go out of this meeting and you do not compel another soul to come with you by next week, you have not done well. You have not done well. It, 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 just so, it doesn't bother you as long as your side is okay. If every other person else, if they perish in their marriage, it really doesn't bother you. But the key is for us to know that we are in partnership with God to build. Every house is built by some man. Every marriage that failed, failed because of the operators. Somebody's operational system went out of alignment with what God intended and it crash landed that particular marriage. God said it's not good that the man should be alone, which is to say it is better when a person is married. But whatever is now making marriage to look like hell on earth, that those who are in it, they want to get out and uh, they are scaring and petrifying those who are hoping to get into it because it looks like, why is it not working? If, we, if I go into it too, will it ever work for me? What's going wrong? Somebody's got to take responsibility. And here is how. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, himself is speaking. You and I will know Jesus' word is reliable. Jesus will tell us the truth. Speaking said, he who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will call him a wise man who builded his house. He is a wise man, not because of the league institution that he attended. He is a wise man because of his economic or social pedigree, he is a wise man, not because of his exposure and being widely traveled. He is a wise man because he heard what the Lord has said and he put it to work. Jesus, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The winds blew, the rains beat on it. The storms came, 
everything that the vicissitudes of life could throw at it was thrown at this house. He said, but the house did not fall. It stood. Why? Is it because what happened to it was not bad enough? No. What happened to it was, was sufficient to crumble it, but it did not fall. Why? Because it was built on a rock. What is the rock foundation to it? The man was wise. The man in that house was a wise man. What made him wise? Not his pedigree, but his obedience to do the word of God. Then Jesus said, in like manner, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken him unto a foolish man. It's not okay to call somebody a fool. But when the divine perspective even calls you a fool, that's a real big fool situation. Jesus said, I will liken him to a fool who built his house upon the sand. Then the winds blew, the rains came, the storms came. The same vicissitude of life that beat upon the first house beat upon this, same, uh, this second house, and the house fell. Here, here's Jesus' conclusion. And great was the fall of it. Why? The house was built by one man, but when it fell, it affected so many people, affected the wife, affected the children, affected the children's perception to marriage and how they eventually treated the people they eventually married and the damage that they left in their own generation and how that damage kept going on in the ripple effect from generation to generation because one man built his house on the sand, not going by the word of God. My brothers and my sisters, it's time for us to like call ourselves to order. It's time for us to call ourselves to order. The first thing I want you to note is this, that, that the family and civilization, they are tightly connected. The family and civilization, they are tightly connected in all generations, whether it's in the stony age or it's in the middle age, or it's in the uh, medieval times or in the 19th or the 20th century, today and even forever, the connection between family and civilization is a tight connection. Hear this. Whatever we see in civilization is the expression of the philosophies, is the expression of the uh, uh, conscientiousness. Uh, 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 it's the expression of the mindset that is ruling in their homes. So all corrupt leaders, they come from a home. That sturdily, you know, uh, arm robbers, they come from a home. You know, drug users and drug peddlers, they come from a home. Their home is the place that molds these people and releases them into the society. Then when they become prominent, they will then alter the foundation, the pillars of the society, and then begin to return back to the home, what, what looks like a womb returning a full-grown child in return for just a little seed of spermatozoa. So what the family brings out, the society will take it into its womb and then magnify it and then magnify it. So if we are going to heal the society, the place to start is to heal the marriage, is to heal the home. Number two, please understand how that, how a man perceives the marriage institution is critical to how he is going to apply himself to his marriage and to his own, how he perceives the meaning of marriage. If he perceives it wrongly, if he perceives it according to the nuances of his ancestry, how a man perceives this institution called marriage will determine to a great extent whether or not and how his wife will submit to him in the union and how his children will follow through with his action plan. It's amazing to me that if you go by the New Testament criteria for ordination, no man should be ordained who has not been, 
uh, who has not who has not secured a positive report from his marriage. You know how Paul writing to Timothy to Titus laying the foundations on how people should be ordained in churches. So whether it be a deacon, an elder, a pastor, or a bishop, let him first let him first show that his home is okay before you ordain him in the body of Christ to take care of people. Let's be sure that he is taking care of his wife and his children properly to the glory of God. And if his wife doesn't feel like he's representing Jesus properly, put the guy's ordination on hold. If the children don't think that that is an inspiration, you know, leading us to come closer to God, don't ordain him yet. Let him work it out in the marriage and in his family before you now bring him to the forefront of the church. But we don't do that anymore. As a matter of fact, we ordain them bachelors and spinsters. And the moment they are ordained, young women think that they are far more attractive than the others because he has just been ordained. He must be a very strong spiritual guide for him to have been ordained. But that's not, that's not what the Bible prescribes. So it's important for you and I to know that marriage is so critical at the center of God's plan for humanity. That's why the first institution that God set up is marriage. That's the first. And that's the mother of all other institutions. So number three, why must we develop this curriculum? Why must we pay close attention to this matter we are discussing today? on how to treat the woman right. Number three, because marriage is losing its role of providing a steady and secure emotional base for everybody in the family. This is why we must address this issue now. We can no longer fold our heads and say, okay, it's really not my business, you know. Uh, no, marriage is losing its role of providing a steady and secure emotional base for everyone in the home. Marriage is losing its sacredness. Marriage is fast losing, you know, its, uh, its, its place as the, the, the nesting place, the heaven, the heaven, not heaven, the heaven of, uh, of mutual trust, respect, and protection. We are losing that. So we can't go on the way we're going on. We can't. If you think it's bad right now, if we don't begin to take steps to change it, it's going to be worse for our children. It's going to be worse. You know why? As marriage is losing its, its place, its role of providing a steady and secure emotional base for those who are in that family, alternative forms of marriages are now being advocated everywhere. Alternative forms of marriages are now being advocated everywhere. They are passing laws to protect the alternative types of marriages everywhere. And of course, the more they continue to do this, your children and my children, they are going to grow up into a generation where good would have become evil, and then evil would have been promoted to the status of good by well-meaning nations, by leading nations in civilization to such an extent that there's no way you can tell your children anymore that what the Bible says is correct. No, no, something must be wrong with the Bible. It, maybe it's obsolete. Maybe it has become uh, 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 irrelevant in our day. You know, uh, they will take what the society is saying above what the Bible is saying because we have failed in our, in our marriage culture, the kingdom marriage culture, the kingdom of God marriage culture, God's way of doing things marriage culture. Number four, why must we put our heads together and develop this compendium? Because instead of supporting each other in complementing, in complementary and cooperating roles, Men are, and women, they are now fighting. Genders are fighting to dominate one another. 
You may not think that your wife is fighting you at home or trying to dominate you. Wait until you hear her give her own opinion in a public space when they are discussing this, this issue of man being head, a woman being wife, submission or no submission. Wait to hear her opinion. That's when you realize that, wow, wow, is this what she thinks? You may not feel that your husband is trying to oppress you or to dominate you, but wait until you hear his opinion. When they are discussing, you know, what should be the relationship between a husband and a wife, and suddenly begin to hear something, and you just wonder, wow, is that how you see me? The point I'm making is this. There is a gender war going on out there. Each and every one of us has a role to play in this war. Whether to represent the word of God and be the light to the nation, or we'll just take sides according to the varying divide. And guess what? It doesn't matter who wins in this war. If the men win, God loses. If the women win, God loses. Either way, God loses. The only way God can win is for us to stand to do his word instead of seeking to dominate one another instead of seeking to dominate one another. Why should I love my wife as Christ has loved the church and make all the sacrifices for her because I'm under commandment? Why should my wife submit to me in all things like the church is submitted even unto Christ because she's under a commandment? But what if she remembers that men uh, maltreat women that submit to them. That's the war going on out there. What if I remember that, ah, no, women, ah, no, uh, they've told us that you can never trust a woman. They've told us men that, ah, no, 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 every woman is self-centered. She will tell you that your money as a man is our money, but her own money is for her and for her children. Every woman has a plan to take care of herself and the children. You are not included. So the sacrifices you are making for the woman and the children, you're only killing yourself. You better wake up, spell the coffee, and try to have a life and take care of yourself. We may hear all of those rubbish. And guess what? The word of God has not changed. That as Christ loved the church and gave himself for that church, even though part of that church was Judas Iscariot that sold him off for 30 pieces of silver, that he still had to die for that church, even though that church included Peter, who just for the confrontation of a young woman denied him three times, he still had to die for that church, even though that church was comprised of apostles that as soon as he went to heaven, they said, me, I go out fishing, and six others followed him, he yet had to die for that church, even though that church be filled with Ananias and Sapphira that would lie to the Holy Ghost, yet he died for that church, even though that church be filled with you and me, he still died for that church. Why? He says, so that the world may know that I'll do my father's commandment. We have to decide that we are not going to be a part of this gender war that is going on out there. And right now, we now have radicalized gender agents, agents of the radicalized philosophies of the different genders. So things you never had heard about or read about 20 years ago, they are now in the forefront. Now in the forefront. Now in the forefront. But the hope of God that this situation can still be saved, rest with you and me squarely, no other way. Jesus is not coming back here a second time to come and die. No, he has died all the death he needed to die. It is time for those of us that have received the benefit of his death, let us also die for him that his light might go on, might pass on to other people. He's died for us to live, but let us now die for him so that his life can pass through us to somebody else. Number four. Number four. Why must we wake up and repair our walls in this season? 
Parenting has become extremely difficult. People are having challenges raising their children. They say, okay, it's because uh, both parents are working now. Then you ask the questions, why are both parents working now? Well, because life is far more expensive now. You know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Now, raising children has become difficult. It's even far more difficult in the, in the Western nations where they are gradually stripping parents of the right, the natural right to groom their children and pattern the course of what should be the upbringing of their children. The Bible speaking in Luke chapter four and in verse 16, I'm almost rounding up now, two more points. So get ready to speak up. The Bible speaking in Luke chapter four, and in verse number 16, he says that Jesus, when he had come into Nazareth, where he was brought up, he went into the temple as his custom was. This is Jesus, conceived of the Holy Ghost, conceived by a virgin through the power of the Holy Ghost. He still needed to be brought up by someone. This same Jesus still needed to be taught a custom by those who brought him up. No government has right to claim my children that they did not help me bear. No government has that right. It's an ungodly act. It's an ungodly legislation. It's an aberration to nation. It's satanic to say the least. It is. So please, we need to reposition ourselves. People say, I ah, know the way African parents, raise. please let's just shut up on those things. Okay, you are where you are today because of the way your parents raised you. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. African parents don't just beat their children. Beating is not the only way we were raised. I know everything is zeroed into beating. No, 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 it's not beating. And every beating is now called abuse. It's not true. Even here in Canada, the welfare law that talks about not abusing a child says that you can't beat the child with something that has a flat surface like a spatula. And you can only hit them where there is flesh like their buttocks, but it must not leave a mark. That's the law. But even before matters escalate and requiring spanking, what about talking? What about educating? What about discipling the child? But raising children has become more difficult than ever. And let me tell you where the difficulty really starts. When the children see hypocrisy in their parents, that what they say is different from who they are to one another, they lose their respect to continue to follow your admonition. They lose it. They lose it. Number six, why must we come together and create this curriculum? Adultery is now on the increase from both men and women everywhere. Adultery is no longer treated like a capital spiritual sin. No, it's just a problem. It's an issue. It's uh, something went wrong. Please hear me. Like I said, I'm not speaking to us as though somebody who is trying to be lamba uh, bombastic or, or to lambast others. No, I'm speaking to us, from me to you. This is not right. This is not right. The same things you used to do in those days, in the early years of your Christianity, and you will cry profusely. You will cry profusely. If they gave you the microphone to come out and sing, you tell them, no, you are sick. There's something in your stomach you cannot sing today. You know, you will cry profusely. Why? Because you felt you have just let God down. But now, with equa 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 equanimity, with levity, with utter impunity, you can now sing, 
get up and tell that person with whom you have seen. Let's just pray before I drive out. Let's just pray for a safe journey, okay? That's not right. And I'm talking to all of us. That's not right. That's not right. That's the devil's way of doing things. That's the kingdom of Satan instead of the kingdom of God. He is helping us to move away from how God wants things done and is pushing us and luring us into how he wants things done. Please hear me. It is not the physicality of the act that is just the big issue. There is a spiritual colonization going on. You, you should weep and grieve when your heart no longer punishes you when you have sinned, when your conscience no longer beats you when you have sinned. You have not grown. It's that's not maturity. No, 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 no. You didn't grow. You are falling. You are going into imprisonment. You are gradually becoming a slave who has no right. You're falling. And this should not be. Maybe husband and wife, they would even resolve issues more. If not that everybody is working out a side, a side coping mechanism. You hear women talk about their young boys do they just wonder, am I in the church or am I in Babylon? Christian women talking about the young boy out there. And it doesn't matter what you, the husband you give to them, they will use your money to sponsor that young boy. You know, so the reason they no longer care whether you come home early or you come home late, the reason they no longer care whether you're able to perform or you are not able to perform is because their tank is full. It has already been filled up by some alternative uh, uh, energy source. The reason the men no longer, you do all your crap, they don't complain anymore. You think, oh, they are mature, they, they can handle me. They can't handle you. They've, they've sorted, they've replaced you. Replaced you. And that's going on the rise right now, all over from the Pope to the young convert, from the pulpit to the pew. If you talk to young girls and they tell you how much of relationship they have with married men, you just wonder, these men that have wives at home, what's chasing them out of that place? I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So, so we're in a bad situation. Remember, it's an us thing. We are in a bad state. Yeah, I know. Yes, I, I can see a brother, you know, who say, I me, mean, thank God, though, I don't do those things. Yeah, thank God that you are not doing it. But the fact that your backyard is safe doesn't mean that the rest of the world should burn. There's fire on the mountain. This is not how we were taught to be Christians. And this is... I, if this is how it was going to be, why were they forcing us not to marry unbelievers? If this is what it was going to be, they married the disco chick, married the disco friend, that that guy that knew you, could handle you, would not disturb you from going to church. But when it came to friendship, you two were friends, but we were told not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But you see how we are messing it all up. We need to retrain. That's the point I'm trying to make. The why we must retrain. This cannot be the pattern we'll transfer to our children. Lastly, why must we do this at this point in time in history? Because an increasing percentage of the population that are beginning to engage in incestuous activities and homosexual activities. When we were growing up, the rebuke they used to preach to men is, don't sleep with your housemaids. Then several years later, don't sleep with that girl that they brought from the village who is remotely related to you that was brought to live with you. Then they began to say, don't sleep with your, your cousin's daughter that came to live with you. Don't allow your, your brother's son to sleep even with your daughters in the house. Watch out for those adults in the house. But now the situation has become 
unbearably and intolerably, you know, horrible, where fathers are having sex, sleeping with their biological daughters, not the daughter of their wife brought from a previous relationship, their own biological daughters. Something has gone wrong up here that the man would have an erection and lie down with his daughter. I'm not saying it is new. For some of you, I'm sure you know the story of the renowned great female general of God, you know, uh, um, uh, Joyce Meyer, whose ministry has touched the world, touched millions. And she's told us her story over and over, how her father, you know, abused her for many years had sex with her for many years, not once, not twice, not 100 times, not 300 times, for years on a consistent basis. And her mother said she could not intervene even when she knew what was going on because she didn't have any skills, she didn't have any education. So if she confronted the father and the father kicked them out, what was she going to uh, depend on? But thank God that with all that happened to her, God took hold of it and has used it to mold her into a fountain of refreshing, refreshing gospel on how to enjoy your everyday life. God has used her to bring her father into salvation. He apologized before he died. God has used her to bring her mother into salvation. But today, this is becoming too frequent, too, hey. I experienced one, the sister said when she was growing up, she knew her father was doing it with her elder sister. But she found out that her elder sister was not reporting because the elder sister was using it to get anything from their dad. Whatever she wants, the dad will oblige. So she thought it would end with the elder sister. Then one of those days, the father invited her to travel with her. I mean, dad invited to travel. The innocency of any child would be to rejoice over it. She went, long story made short. She said that night in that hotel room, he had gone out for his meetings, came back. By the time he came back, she had already eaten and gone to bed. But that night, she felt his hands all over her and she froze, started shaking. And she said to me, Pastor Ken, the rest of what happened, I don't know. But the result is this. If any man was a friend to her, as long as it is platonic, everything is okay. But the moment you try to be affectionate with her, she goes into that frenzy again. It all comes back. And she said she had never wanted to marry until she came to the program I used to host in the University of George back then called Dating and Courtship Circles. They paid, I think about, uh, I think it was 15 Naira in those days, 15 Naira to attend the 12 module course. You know, but she came from such a wealthy background that her, her, all, her seed of thanksgiving was sufficient to sponsor about 10 other people. She said, God used that, that DCC, DCC course to break the back of the enemy. Now she's looking forward to getting married. Of course, she's been married now. This ought not to be that men can now sleep with their daughters and still act, have a normalcy of life. This should not be. If all these things are happening, it just simply means that the template of our civilization is about to lead us into an implosion. We are going to implode. We are about to destroy ourselves. Sodom and Gomorrah, God came and destroyed them. But study the civilizations before us. We are not the first civilized people, you know. There was a time when Egypt was the leading civilizations in this world. When you, when you study a little bit of uh, archaeology and anthropology and all of that stuff, you'll see something that, you, that you, you'll be like, ah, you mean uh, 2,000 years ago they were this technologically advanced? Then you had the, the, the Greek you know, time, the Greek era, when they were ruling the civilization. So much was done. All the Socrates you are reading about today, they came from that era. Then we had the era of the Roman Empire. 
different, different empires. But somewhere along the line, they brutalized marriages until they would implode. This is self-destruction. We have to speak up. We have to do something about it. You know, many years ago, and I'm closing down on my, on my speech. Many years ago, God used a man called Demon Shakaria to start the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And through him, Christian men were now taught they were cultured, they were coached on how to be business, Christian businessmen in the, in the public domain. And through that, a lot of them, their lives affected their generation. And many who were not Christians came to become Christians when they met this, this, this movement of Christians who are businessmen. I think now we need to prayerfully seek from God that he will send us a new altar, something that will be a full gospel, you know, husband's movements, so that we can begin to talk to ourselves. It is no longer acceptable that is the women that should go for counseling. It is no longer acceptable because you see, everything rises and falls with leadership. It is no longer sufficient to say, okay, uh, she doesn't listen to me anyway, you know, so uh, she's going to do what she's going to do. No, if you abdicate your role, listen, the place of headship of their home is not supposed to be a, a, a simple leisure place. No, 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 no. It's a place of responsibility. So it's time now for us to put our hearts together. Let us speak to one another. Let us see what we want to see happen. Let's stop complaining about what has happened. You know, I keep saying that all the domestic abuses that we've been discussing in the social media, it was just about how the matters ended. What led to it is what we must repair. It's teaching time. They say it saves nine. This is the end of my articulation. And I'm going to uh, invite my wife if she can. Because, uh, Dr. Tunde is in Seattle today. Uh, and Sister Joy is in uh, Louisiana. So uh, I'm going to invite my wife to please unmute and help us with the Q&A, not just questions and answers, but your position. What do you think that men should know? Women, speak up for us. Brothers, if you are getting it right, help us to get it right as well. Over to you, my honey. Well done, honey. Thank you so very, very much. Now it's raining very heavily here. So my laptop is not even cooperating. I'm only using my phone. So I don't know if you can see me. I don't know if you can oh, hear me. Uh, I can hear you, but I'm looking. Okay, I found you now. Okay, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, honey, for this. Um, What's his name? Um, double pin for us. Double pin so that. Uh, no, don't worry. He knows. <laughs> Pardon my literacy, some of us are just not aware. Adiza, I will enjoy you. Oh, just no, no, hold no, yourself. No, 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 it wasn't my princess. <laughs> Mama, don't worry. I'll educate you a bit more. Jesus Christ. I even thought it was Adiza. Oh, eh? no. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you later. All right. So, honey, yeah. I, I honestly... I have been waiting. Your video has been spotlighted. Okay. I have been waiting, and I know it's not only me who has been waiting for an opportunity like this. Mm -hmm. And I pray that God will give women the chance to take advantage of a forum like this, an opportunity like this, to be able to speak not from a place of judgment, but from a place of, like you have rightly said, if we don't do something quickly, we're going to have an implosion. Now, some we live in Nigeria, a whole lot of us here live in Nigeria. So we are victims of bad governance and it deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated because 
everybody chose to stay mute. Everybody chose to stay quiet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Everybody chose to stay mute. Everybody chose to stay quiet because no one wanted to sound like the odd one. Am I going to be the one that is going to be speaking negative about my husband? Where, or speaking about the state of the nation, am I going to be the one to speak about a relative or whatsoever who is in government? But you don't have this kind of things abroad. When you goof, I, I, as a leader, they call you out. If, he, if your husband is a member of parliament, it does not mean that being your wife, I must support you blindly. No, you don't have that abroad. And that's why we see order as it is, because people know if you goof, they will call you out regardless. And the fact that I'm calling you out on this matter does not mean you are a failure on every matter, but on this matter, you are failing. But what I see that we have in the church is like, um, how do I put this now? It's like a bottle of Coke. We, can, we gather women, we speak to women, we tongue-lash women, we insult women, we remind women of submission, we remind women of how this one, how that one, and the woman goes back home like a bottle of Coke that they are shaking. But all she meets is a ceiling. She meets a man who does not even have a clue so I want to tell you only that I am particularly grateful and I hope that this will not just be a one-off because women have heard enough. Women have been corrected enough to have a balanced and a holistic approach to fixing the decay in family life. It's about time that men are gathered together, men alone, leave women out of this because when um, we have women conventions. By the grace of God, I speak at loads of women conventions. And a lot of times women leave dejected. Is it only us that we do this work? And we just say, well, continue to do it. If the man says it is sex, go and try some more. If it is finances, you go and do five jobs. If it is communication, you initiate. We, we are not even trying to place the spotlight on the failure of a lot of men who are married, who are clueless on what it takes to be a married man. I ministered somewhere yesterday and I said, you can be a successful pastor and a colossal failure in your family life. You can be a successful businessman and be a prodigal husband that your wife is not enjoying you, it's not feeling you, it's not even aware. But because we have mastered the art of covering for our spouses, because we obey the word of God, we, they, I know I'm speaking because my ears are full. I meet with people day in, day out on what will I do? I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. And until the matter become terrible, like the Osinachi matter, nobody, you know, fixes it. You have spoken extensively about immorality. You have spoken a lot about sexual impurity. Only I wish that was the only problem. I wish if it was only sex and sexuality, honestly, we're okay. But we are talking about clueless leaders. We are talking about people who don't even understand priesthood. We're talking about people who don't even understand that the home was given to the man. Let's go back to the book of genes, Genesis. God gave the total running of the home to Adam. The role of the woman is the role of help. Honey, is that what we have today? Men have taken their hands off totally. Men have forgotten. So honestly, I wish you just said, women, don't come. Don't attend the meeting for the next three weeks. It's okay. Gather your husbands. Gather your brothers. Go and bring your male friends. Go and bring them. We need to talk to ourselves. We can't do the work. Just like a woman can only do the work of a woman. 
She can only, like a mother can only be a mother. No man can carry pregnancy. That's how men cannot, cannot but do what God has assigned them to be too many men are prodigal. So I want to open the floor today. And women, I pray by the mercy of God that you are able to remove the veil. We prayed a prayer at the beginning about the mind being blind. I think a lot of men are blinded in their minds. We are permanently turning the light on the women as though the woman is their own builder. No, God spoke to Adam. God spoke to Abraham. Go back to scriptures. Like gaps is why women fill in the gap. Gaps is why women fill in. When a father fails to be a father, the woman begins to father. When a man fails to provide, the woman begins to provide. When a man fails to be a cover, the woman takes on the cover. These are not our roles. So I honestly will pray that women will understand this great opportunity and latch on it because women too are dying quietly. Too many abandoned wives, they have been abandoned. Abandoned emotionally, abandoned sexually, abandoned in every way. That they are like people falling from a tree. And anyone that they catch while falling is who they hold on to. Many times they are wrong and illicit relationships. Well, how did they get there? How did Mrs. Spotify start admiring a 17-year-old boy in the house? <laughs> Where was her husband? He felt she needed money. I've, I've, men even try to understand because if you don't develop your helper, God said to Adam, this is your land, cultivate it. How many men even understand the assignment? How many understand the assignment? I'm not preaching. I'm only trying to help you understand, honey. One, that this is not a... When you were preaching at us women, you lashed us well and we took the lashing. I think you should please leave women out, face the men, one after the other. Are you a prodigal husband? Are you a providing husband? Are you available emotionally? When your wife has issues in her life, who does she talk to? Are you available? Are you a developer? Are you cultivating her? Where have you reached in cultivating? These are the issues. These are the issues. We need a revolution in the men's world. We need a revolution. For our men, we do so that it will be easy for the woman to do what she was ordained to do. So enough said, the floor is opened. Who wants to speak? I don't think any woman who wants progress should talk from the back. When we, we, we want, they said we should vent. Let's vent. Let's vent. Let's have this conversation so that when pastor now says, okay, oh, Monday is for everybody, but Tuesday, if you want to be a functional man, you want to be the king of your family, you want to be the, the priest of your family, you want to be the apostle in your family, you want to be the developer, you want to be the leader, let us. Ed Lewis Cole was the last person that spoke to the masculine gender. T.D. Jax tries now and again, Pastor Taiwo Dukaya tries. Who speaks to the men? Who speaks to the men? Where before you say one or two things, we start hearing submission. Women are just choked and nobody's addressing the real issues. Who is taking care? You took a woman from a father's house. Now you will care for her. Are you doing that? These are the issues. These are the issues. The floor is open. My sisters, like Pastor said, talk, speak up. The Lord will help us. He will give us grace. But until we speak what's in our mind, they will not know too much of body language. They're just trying to, you know, and uh, you should know what I'm saying. No, 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 no. Nobody is supposed to know what you are saying. Say it. Say it. I oh. think I did go down a record. Well, I had this. I, I said it. Mm. So please speak up. Thank you so, 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 so much. I want to uh, use the, my privileged position to call on just two persons. Uh, so, uh, boss, you like, you get ready. But I want to start with uh, Auntie uh, uh, Olabinto. Um, what, what's your take at this point in history? What, what are the men getting right? What are they getting wrong? As a mother in Israel, 
what would you advocate that the first thing during this curriculum building, the first thing that we should begin to attend to should be ABC. Uh, Sister Labito, if you could please unmute, and if you are on camera, it would be very, very nice. We want to hear your opinion on this. Please pardon me not to be on camera, sir, but I'm right here. Okay, Thank you so much, um, Pastor Ken. Um, allow me to be a bit emotional. Thank you so much, my baby sis. Thank you, you said it all. I'm going to be talking from my own experience and my own culture. I'm a Yoruba woman married to a Yoruba man. The first thing we need to address, Pastor Ken, is that they should forget everything their fathers taught them. A lot of them, their fathers didn't teach them well. And I say that with all sense of responsibility. You understand what I'm saying? A man doesn't do this. A man doesn't do that. A man doesn't do this. A man doesn't do that. You hear some Yoruba men saying, but my grandmother, and I say, go marry your grandmother. Don't tell me that. Do you understand? So I think we should leave a culture. I'm not saying there's some good things about our culture, but I think the culture that the men should imbibe is the culture of the Bible. What does the Bible say? What, what, what did the Bible call you as a man? You understand? I went somewhere a few Sundays ago, and the man in the house, this man is close to 60. He was washing the dishes. He was doing everything. He was the one that waited on us. Pastor Ken, my mouth was wide open. I have never seen it in my life. I was like, what is going on here? And the wife said, oh, he vacuums. I was to me, it was strange. You sit me, I will do the dishes. I'll wait <laughs> for you. Because a miracle has happened in my life. I once was blind, but now I can see in Canada. Praise <laughs> the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? That might not work for some people, but that, but that works for them. And they had a fairly good marriage. So my own take is, so that I'm not talking too much, is forget about the culture. Imbibe what the Bible is saying. Imbibe what the Bible is saying. I'm talking to my Yoruba brothers. Yeah. I don't know about the evil and everything like that forget about it i mean i saw my mother make some mistakes with my brother and like you like like you said he's seen the light now you, un you understand that's number one number two that i'm going to say is something um my baby sis um, um has said we are helpmates we are helpmates and that is where there's a break there's always a breakdown of law and order when a woman is trying to be a man she can only do it for a short while it's not sustainable. It is not sustainable. And that is why we have all kinds of nonsensical things happening in marriages. So you've said it all, Pastor Ken. Let us go back to what the word of God is. As a matter of fact, the Bible is our life manual. That is our life manual. So we should just go back and read the manual to know what to do. You ask me what has worked in my marriage. One thing that I always say is, my husband and I don't get angry at the same time. It doesn't mean that we don't get angry. We just take it in turn. So if he gets angry on Sunday, I get angry on Monday. We don't get angry at the same time because we need to hear what the other person is saying. When two people get angry together, the communication is lost. There's communication distortion. So we don't get angry together. We wait for each other to cool down and then the other person um, gets angry. Another thing that we have started to do, we didn't do it initially, is we began to set goals in our marriages, not just financially, but you know, to say, oh, this is where we're going to be at this point in time, just to agree, maybe that's the word I'm looking for. We begin to agree on a lot of things. So it's like, oh, Dusala, you have to do this. I'm like, uh-uh, I don't have the power. Oh, you, my, I tell my husband, you have to do this. Like, you know what? That's not my area of strength. So communication, agreement, and knowing who is supposed to do what. Not that, oh, you have to do everything or the other person has to do everything. Oh. So um, that's my submission. Thank you so, 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 so much. And I pray what is good for the Yoruba brothers will also do well for the Edo, Ibo, Ibibio, and Hausa brothers. Let's go back to the word of God. Matthew 7 that we read from today. It's very, very instructive in that regard. Yes, I want to go on to uh, Lady B, Bossy Alagbaye, if you are near, uh, if you could unmute your mic. And if uh, you want to be on video as well, please turn on your video. 
if we begin to develop a curriculum for men, what is your first take as to the one thing that we must address? Hi, um, Pastor Ken. Um, it's a good thing that you and um, um, Mama T are doing. So well done. It's my second time joining. So um, it's been really insightful. I joined a bit late, so I caught um, the end of what you said. Um, but, you know, if you say, I think when you talk about, you know, your first question was, you know, there's a curriculum for men, what should it be? Um, I think I'll start by saying that, you know, everyone is different, right? Yeah. And so I doubt there'll be one size fits all. I don't think there'll be a curriculum that'll fit everyone. Mm -hmm. But I'll say that you have to look at your marriage, the person you've married, the person you're with, you know, um, their weaknesses, their strengths, and work together as one. Um, if I use my own marriage as an example, when we first got married, we had a vision and our vision was to be an example to other married people, to encourage people. You know, my, my parents had a very, you know, healthy, you know, good marriage, long marriage. And so they were, you know, they, they set that, you know, they set the scene well for me. They, you know, they brought me up well to kind of understand what marriage was like. And it wasn't devoid of challenges, but, you know, so in my mind, that's what I wanted. And for the first few years, we were really good, you know, you know, um, you know, supported many other people and, you know, people looked up to us and all that. Um, you know, as time went by, you know, we had children, things were still okay. But, you know, then what happens is life gets busy. You know, you're running, you know, um, the home you have, you know, you know, you have to you know, work, you know, we, we live abroad, you know, so it's not the same and stuff. And, you know, so we realized that, you know, we'd kind of forgotten that vision, you know, because we became almost, you um, it was just about, okay, what do I want to when considering each other? So you have to look at what the other person, um, what they need, you know, what makes them happy, what makes them tick. And so, you know, there's no marriage that's perfect. You know, you have your ups and downs. But what I'll say is just kind of put yourself in the other person's shoes. You know, um, where we, what we, what we, what I feel that we do well is that, you know, even when we disagree, we don't do personal insults. We don't attack, you know, there's, there's still that mutual respect. I might believe it. So I'm, that's not to say that I'm living and I'm angry and I'm just like smiling. No, you know, we still have, a, you know, we still talk and all that, you know, we still have arguments, but essentially there's that, you know, it's almost like that's the, that line that you, you can't cross. There's a way you talk to me. There's a way you talk to you. There's a way I talk to you, you know, but what I'll say is uh, living abroad, you know, things are different because the man has to step up and do many other things. You know, it's not, you don't have maids here unless you get an au pair or someone to live with you. So there are many things that maybe if we lived, you know, um, you, you know, in our part, you know, where we've come from in Nigeria that you'd be able to outsource, um, you know, um, we still outsource, but it's about stepping up. So he'll do the dishes, you know, he'll do the laundry, he'll help iron the uniform, I'll cook, you know. So it's just about understanding the terrain you're in and working together as a team, you know, so that's what I'll say. But like I said, it's not devoid of challenges. But you know it can work. I mean, I think my personal gripe is that we hear so much about marriages that don't work. That, in fact, if you're not careful at the back of your mind, you're expecting things to go wrong all the time. So we have to hold on to what God says because every time you have about marriage, it's like, oh, this one is divorced. They're having problems. They're having affairs. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we know that. You know, when things are going well, you don't hear it. No one announces that. No one does. You know. So I think we also need to celebrate the good things. Um, about marriage. Um, I feel like I'm waffling now. But anyway, um, so that, that's my piece. That's me done. <laughs> oh, no, no. Thank you for your contribution. I think it was about four weeks ago. I, I gave a teaching uh, focusing particularly on this last point you made that why do we celebrate? Why don't we announce the good things we are getting right in marriages? If somebody wants to celebrate their 25 years of marriage or 25 years anniversary in the church, what you hear is so God be the glory, it be the mercies of God for 25 years. What does that mean? You slept on the steering and God, Jesus took control? Is that what you're telling us? No, it is not pride to say, I learned to respect my wife and that has taken us a long way. It is not pride. It's not taking it away from God to say, I have learned to let my wife make the decision because it's a better decision maker for the rest of us and it has worked well for us. It is not pride to say, I let my husband have his way because he's one sacrificial. Let's see what we are doing right so that our testimonies will give body to what the instructions in scriptures, you know, have laid out. But all you just hear is, praise God, we've been married for 30 years. We just came to celebrate the mercies of God. Somebody shout hallelujah and we go hallelujah. But when there is a fight, a video will come out on it. 
everything will come out in vivid pictures. I think we should begin to put out uh, a, a, a bit more, you know, a bit more. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, like my wife said, we are now going to uh, leave the floor open. So if you want to say something, could you raise your hand so that we can uh, pin you up and highlight you? Please raise Honey, your I think you should call us. Say that again. Hold on, say that again. She said she thinks you should call Ashi. You should call Ashi. Okay. Uh, I think her network is... It's gone bad. Okay. Is, uh, is there Ashi in the house? Oh, yeah. Ashi at Zigbo. Yeah. So, Ashi, uh, Mama thinks that I agree with her as well. Uh, now that we are thinking of how to regroom our men to become better husbands, spirit-filled husbands, you know, what do you think we should look at critically? Where are we missing it? Thank you so much, Pastor Ken and uh, Pastor Tinu. God bless you. As usual, this is my, I look forward to this almost every Monday as much as I can. Um, I think the conversation from the point of view you've taken is pretty important in the sense that it absolves women from the responsibility of um, the idea that if you do what you need to do, then the men should do what they need to do. The idea now is just make, what do you think men can do to make it better? Um, I've always had problems addressing issues in my marriage because in certain areas, my husband does excellently well, you know? So it's almost like you're minimizing his efforts on one side when you put on the table something that is of a concern. So, but there are two points I spoke with Pastor Tino about and she just said, I, it's rather than texting, I should speak one. I think the, not, the idea that men uh, process and see from the place of respect has been taught to us for many years. That if you want to get, if you want a man to hear your message, you should, um, you should couch it on the basis of respect. But I think many times the teaching does, is not reciprocal and you're not taught as men that women respond to respect as well. I think the last speaker alluded to it that in times of heated arguments, there are certain lines you do not cross simply because you respect the person as an individual, not because she's your wife, that is secondary, but because you respect who she is as a person, as a creation from God, you look at her and like, I wouldn't do this somewhere else. So I definitely will not do this to my wife. So I think that's really, really important that the conversation of respect is not solely for men alone or husbands alone, but it is a conversation that is necessary for any, any relationship to be successful. That's the first point I thought of. The second one I also thought of was that because a man is an excellent provider materially, you know, he, he's not the person that abdicates from his responsibility in terms of fees, taking care of the children, or even spirituality, you know, so it's not that he, you know, so, but because a man is a, a competent provider does not absolve him from being emotionally accessible or um, present to his spouse. That because, but I'm doing this, the idea is like, but see what I'm doing does not mean that, okay, you still don't have a responsibility on that end. So I think those are two things that are pretty weighing heavy on my mind that I thought to mention. Which is to say, we should groom the men to be 360, uh, 360 to have 360 uh, degree success. Uh, being good on one side does not exonerate you from being good in the other. Uh, marriage or family life, uh, it's like driving a car. It takes a whole lot combined to uh, ensure safe driving. Um, we didn't just go to school to read one subject, several subjects were combined to give us the discipline uh, mm -hmm. concerning th that, uh, that particular degree that we have. Okay, thank you so much, Ashi. I also see that we have uh, uh, brother Tomide Olukwade, and I know he deals with uh, young men, mentoring others. Uh, if uh, brother Tomide, you are close, and you are in a safe place where you can speak. Uh, let's hear from the from a man who has been dealing with other men. What are the things we need to 
deal with at this time in history in order to help our men become better spirit-filled husbands. Thank you very much, Pastor Ken. Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Oh, could this be network? Hello, Pastor Ken, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, yes. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this platform to share thoughts and um, really get to the center of God's expectation for marriages at this time. I, I think largely one of the things that men suffer, uh, maybe uh, because of cultural conditioning, is the fact that they do not have accountability partners. They do not have anyone they submit to. So they feel because they are men, they are capable of um, thinking their own thoughts, um, doing what they, they feel they should do. And so there is nobody speaking to their lives. And for those in church, um, they just go, uh, it's a perfunctory thing, go to church, hear the message, go back home, do nothing about it. So there is no active uh, Christian walk. I think a lot of men are stagnated in their Christian walk. Um, and and um, if, if you are not progressively moving forward, the ground, the very ground you, you are on grows weary of you and sucks you in. You are dead. So I, I think that's the mistake. Um, a whole lot of people are not opening up their minds and their hearts to, um, to authority figures, you know, that can speak into their lives and help them um, make a success of their marriage, um, of their marriages. And that's on the one hand. And again, I think this is related to it. The fact that In, in the church today, there's a whole lot of talk about um, the seven steps and the six steps and the five steps that you need to take, you know, to make your marriage successful. I think really when you get a hold of God or when God gets a hold of you and you understand the, the demands and, and the, the real position of things, that this is a spiritual enterprise. And, you know, the scripture talks about God being the head of Christ, Christ being the head of the man, and the man being the head of his wife. Now, there's an hierarchy. Now, how does, does, does God lord it over Christ? And does Christ lord it over the church or, or, or the man? The spirit of God does not strive with man. God shows us. He says, I stand at the door and knock if any man listens i mean opens the door to him to me i will come in and sup with him now the way christ loves the church is such that christ does not um he does not impose himself on the church he makes himself so available to the church he makes himself so irreplaceable to the church that the church would now gravitate towards him in love. He first loved us, and then we love him. And I think that is what is missing uh, with husbands and even wives, because the two together should understand the scriptures and help one another to live through the eye of the scriptures. Okay, I don't have to wait for my husband to be right, to do the right thing. And I don't have to wait for my wife to be right, to do the right thing. Now, as we engage with God, God will tell us, okay, I gave this girl to you. She's my daughter as well. How are you going to treat her? All right, because you have an understanding that this is not just somebody I picked on the road or on the streets. This is somebody God gave to me to cultivate 
and to bring up to a certain standard. And as uh, and in, in the same way, the, the woman needs to realize that this man came into my life for a purpose. And we are a team working together. One of the things that, that really, really bothers me a lot uh, is the fact that men and women, you know, do not do not realize that they're a team. The man feels I'm the man in the house. The woman feels I'm the woman. But the place of meeting has been neglected. Whereas we are together in this against the world, not against one another. We are not in a competition. So if, if the, uh, one of the things that men should be taught is that it's not a competition and it's not about um, submission, submission, because submission in itself doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that you su subjugate someone or, or put someone under some, some, some form of domination. How we submit to Christ is we see the love of Christ. We see his love. We see his uh, caring nature. And we, we break down crying, oh, how much he loves me. You know, we do that a lot in worship. When we get into that zone where we realize how much God loves us. So I think for me, um, the complementarity that men and women should enjoy, which is the teamship, should be taught that we're a team, we are one together against the world, not against one another. And then men should uh, be taught how they need to submit to other um, authority figures. Thank you, sir. Thank you so, so, so much. That's so, so pivotal. Uh, yes, honey, were you saying something? No, I was just saying well said. That's yes, what... Yeah, because sincerely, uh, more than any other time in the history of the church, uh, us men, we need to have accountability persons over our lives. Somebody that can talk to you and you will not second guess their instruction. You know, uh, you didn't invent the wheels of marriage. You know, so let all those who have gone ahead of you, let them become instructive in how you manage your own affairs. Our time is up, but I wonder, is there anybody who has something to say? At least we've taken about three women or four, and then we've got two men uh, to speak to us. Oh, that's our fourth man, that was, that was our fourth man. Anybody else who want to say something? Um, I always like to keep it to 90 minutes, but if you have something to say, you think we must capture this before we draw the curtain, please raise your hand so that we can ask you to unmute your mic. Anybody? Anybody? Going one, going two. Uh, Elizabeth Ahamze. Uh, please, Elizabeth, go ahead uh, and unmute and give us your thoughts. Thank and you. If you have hey. the camera, you are okay with it. You can turn on your camera. Um, sorry, permit me if I don't have to. I'm just in the office. Okay. And, um, I just, I'm just so excited. And I and I'm texting and it's almost like my heart was pounding because it's like this is an eye opener and not just an eye opener, but the fact that we're getting to this and separating culture from the Bible, because I, I find what most of us are doing is we're mixing both together. There's a culture. And there is the Bible, meaning the instruction, the manual that God gives about life, not just our marriage, but about lives, about everything, our being, who we are, how we should live, how we should talk, how we should transact with each other. Everything that we need to do is, is there. I was talking to my son today, and my son is going through a lot of problems right now, my first son. And the conversation, what he told me was, you are both fake. Oh. And explain to me, what do you mean? Oh. That, and I'm talking about my previous marriage. I'm not talking about 
what I have right now is being God given. I, I finally find out how to be in a healthy relationship, how to actually talk together and have a conversation with a husband that actually listen and we move in as a team. And that is why I'm clapping my hands. I'm like, this is what is called teamwork. This is a marriage is a teamwork. A marriage is, is being is about being accountable. And I and all the points I'm writing it down and I'm like, hallelujah to this, hallelujah to that. Because this is all that is going to make marriage work. We have to unlearn and relearn about what marriage is all about. What is the foundation? How did God start this? And then go back to what the Bible says, because we talk about Bible, but we mix it up with our culture. We slap everything else with it. We take what is good, what we like in the culture. We take what we like in the Bible. We mix everything up together. And we say, this is the standard, which is not. Is either you are talking about the culture or you say what the Bible says, because everything is all over the place. And so, and I was talking to my son today and that was what he told me. He said, because both of you were fake. And I had to ask him, I said, what was it that I was fake about? And he said, well, mom, I don't think you were fake. I think you were very naive and you didn't know what was going on. And I said, thank you for mentioning that because that was exactly what it is. It's not because I didn't hold the word of God is not because I've changed from what I learned from home. It's not because I've not been doing exactly the same thing about submission, about being a good wife, everything that we have been taught to be a good wife, submitting wife and all this, but who are you submitting to? And this is why I'm so happy that we're talking to men here now, that it's not just about coaching women on what to do. Some women are all fed up. But because we're talking about we have a priest at home, a priest that doesn't wake up the children to pray, a priest that drop the children and the wife at the church and take off and watch TV on Sunday. That is, is that a priest? Is that what the standard of what a home is supposed to look like is? And in my conversation with him, he said, I'm not going to be... Um, agnostic because I don't believe there is a God. And he said, prove to me there is a God. And the reason why he's saying that, and I understand that, is simply because his father was preaching God, talking about God, but he never really know anything about God. He never show, showcase God in his own life. And so we confuse the children. We bring them up in a way that they don't even understand what is right and what is wrong anymore because we that say we know God, we're not really showing God. And, and the Bible says when we say we know God, we love God, and we hate or we do all these kind of things, how do you love somebody that you don't see and when you, the person that you see is here? And we're not practicing what we are actually holding on to. So I'm really, really excited about this. I'm so happy that this is happening because it's about time that we're not just speaking to women into having women doing what they're supposed to do. This is what you have to do and things like that. I talked to my husband yesterday. We had a really good argument. And I, when I say good argument is when you actually, we come up with something that, that results into what we need it to result into. It's not about just honey, you're right. I don't like when it's honey, you're right. Just do it your way. No, it's about us, both of us talking about what is right and what is wrong? What should we do? How do we take this from this place now? How do we move on? Accountability is part of it. Teamwork, this uh, all togetherness, making sure things that we really believe the Bible really talks about, the love that Jesus showed to the church, dying for the church, it's unbelievable when we get revelation of exactly what the Bible is talking about when it comes to marriage, then that is exactly when we're really going to see the heart of God and the move of God in our lives. Thank you so much for giving me this. I, I think I took too much time, right. but I'm just so excited. Thank you. So, so, so my wife and I are clapping for you right now. And uh, always so deep, always so articulate. We always enjoy you on the group, and it's, I'm glad you could share your thoughts with us, even on this platform. My brothers and my sisters, um, there's still so much to be said, but no time to say it. 
So we're going to adjourn the class. We touched about 31, 32 of us here today. Uh, by next week, let it be times three. Every man, go look for your Nathaniel. Go talk to your two and tell them, come be a part of this conversation. We all need to get schooled afresh from the preacher to the listener, from the resource person who has gone to do his own research and preach to every listener. Every one of us need to get back, you know, on track to studying what the Bible intended for the man as husband in the house. If the leadership gets it right, if the head gets it right, the rest of the body will also follow. On this note, I want to uh, bring the meeting to a close. I want to salute each and every one of you that was able to join us for prayer and intercession before the main meeting started. I thank you all for taking out time from your busy schedule to be a part of this meeting today. Uh, pray for me, pray for the ministry, pray for God's supernatural increase, spiritually, numerically, financially, everywise, because marriage is the center of our lives on earth, sincerely. If marriage goes well, I'm telling you, there'll be so much peace in your house that your creativity will be accentuated even at work. Your children, it will show even in their own academic work. You know, uh, a few days ago, uh, a non-Christian woman, you know, called me and shared some things with me. I don't like getting involved when I'm counseling with someone. At a point in time, I had to wear my soul shade because I was teary, you know, uh, just about to cry. I saw the note that the son had written, a boy less than 13, now contemplating suicide. He wants to kill himself because living in that house is no longer conducive for him. You know, then about three days ago, I had this young Indian girl, you know, ride with me. When I was going to pick her up, I noticed that she had um, one of this uh, crutch around her right leg. So I quickly came out of my driver's seat and I opened the door for her to climb into the car. Her, by the time I started driving, she said, you know what? I live in a house with people who are my nationalities, but nobody ever stretches out their hand to help me. This year has been a terrible year for me. And I'm like, how can the whole year be terrible? He said, oh yeah, this year alone, I lost my marriage. This year I fell down, broke my leg. This year, this one also happened. This year, this one also happened. And I asked, are you so young? How long were you married for? She said, two years. I said, but why would you leave the marriage just after two years? She said her husband was physically abusive. You know, so I, I thought to myself, you know, this thing of domestic abuse is everywhere. Even though we only make popular the one that happens amongst Christians, this problem about men not getting it right in their office as husbands, it's an epidemic. We need to begin to grapple with it. I am not saying I know it all. My life is short, only 57 years, married for 23 out of those. I will study what others have said. You also go study, bring your thoughts, bring your experiences. Let's put our heads together and educate our men. Every wife, beg your husband, bribe him, promise him, make him, a, make him an offer he cannot refuse so that he'll be here with us next week, uh, Monday. And every uh, spin star, anybody spinning you, anybody eyeing you, anybody buying you Coke and burger, invite them to be a part of this meeting because next week, Monday, we're gonna be dealing with the needs of women. We'll discuss the wants, we'll discuss the desires, but I will zero in on the needs of women in a marriage setting. I thank you all so much for coming on behalf of my lovely wife and other trustees of this ministry. I thank you all for taking our time to be here. Remember, only the doer is blessed. Uh, yeah, Tosin, yes, thank you for writing to me. I'm gonna send you a message immediately after this uh, meeting. So please, you will oblige me no matter okay, what. Okay, sir. All right, then. God bless you all. Let me pray for you before you go. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, just one more request, one more request, one more request. My sisters, please, one more request. Open your eyes. One more request, one more request. On behalf of all men, 
whether your fathers, your uncles, those that raise you, your husbands, on behalf of all men, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you for forgiveness. Whatever we have done to hurt you, I ask you to forgive us. Release us from your heart. Release us from your grief. Just release us, not because we have apologized sufficiently, but just for the blood of Jesus. I ask for your forgiveness on behalf of all men in the name of Jesus. And so, Heavenly Father, I ask you for grace to forgive, grace to release, grace, oh God, for enlightenment to come upon the hearts of men. Father, visit us in dreams, in visions, by the compelling powers of the communicational gift of your spirit. Cause us to hear your voice again concerning how we should manage our marriages and be heads and, and priests and husbands to our homes, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen. All right. God bless you. I'll see Thanks, you sir. next week. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Brother Tomide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tosin. My darling honey. Elias said, thank you. Brother Banwo, thank you. I love the way you were attentive. God bless you, Shade. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Pastor T. <laughs> and my yellow wife. Yes, from Saskatchewan, the land. Thank you, sir. Be and the booth, be well. Don't fall for it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Ken. Thank you. God bless you. My baby sis, I love you. Thank you. I enjoy, I enjoy your ladies. God bless you. Yeah. And then just stand your far out. I love you guys. God bless you. JB. Thank you, sir. God bless you guys. God bless you. I call our wallet bound war. I love and celebrate you, son. God bless you. Great you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great week. Betty Ann, thank you for showing up today. Hallelujah. God bless you, princess. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Great you, sir.